I read this lineup the other day with the best disc records. Who's number one, man? Uh, Tupac, hit him up. Come on, man. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> nah, man. Sorry. First off, touch your shit in the click you claim. West side, when we rock, I'm equipped with game. He just drops it called Badass. And if you listen to it, you can see he heard hit him up. And it's like, oh, that's how it's supposed to be. Uh, bow down. Cause I ain't a hater like you. Bow down to a killer that's greater than you. I, I bow down respectfully. Not bow down to them as mean or right, performance, right. but as elders. If you touch the nerve, He'll let you know. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, he was passionate. <laughs> you know, so he'll let you know. All you old rappers trying to advance, it's all over now. Take it like a man. The West Side Connect thugs. Ain't no California love, no. just California slug. <laughs> Tupac versus Ice Cube. A beef that the majority of hip hop heads didn't know existed. Two West Coast icons that became friends in the early stages of their solo careers but grew apart on their way to the top and eventually clashed due to a misunderstanding. The first time the two met was on tour in 1990, when Tupac was a part of the group Digital Underground. He was a huge fan of Ice Cube, who at that point in time had left his group NWA to pursue a solo career. This was shortly after he dropped his solo debut album America's Most Wanted, which was one of Tupac's favorite albums. The two clicked instantly the moment they met, and became great friends. Pac was very humble, and Cube was very respectful, treated him like a little brother. For Cube, he was just a fun little dude with a lot of energy. Nobody had more fun on tour than Pac. He knocking on my everybody door. On oh, You sleep? What, what? Nah, no sleep. No sleep. Nah. Come on, sleep. man. Get dressed, cute. Come on, let's yeah. go. You know he running around with with all the energy in the world. You know oh, we man. sleep, but he got all the energy in the world. They hung out, rapped on tours, and freestyled together. Cube was able to watch him grow as an artist. He was rapping and dancing on stage with Digital Underground. Nobody knew who Tupac was. He was just getting started. Park used to tell him, this digital ish is cool man, but I want to do records like y'all, cause where I live at, ish is effed up, you know what I'm saying? I want to talk about how the ish is. He wanted to stop making those funny little dance songs with his group and focus on more important stuff. I remember him being a little frustrated, you know mm. what I'm saying, cause he's like, Cube, I want to make the kind of records y'all make, that's what I'm on, I ain't really on this, wow. this dancey dancey stuff. He was just doing that just to, you know, kind of, you know, get started, facilitate till he can get and do his own style. So mm -hmm. I was like, well, keep doing your thing. You know, you know, Shock Gia, he'll see, you know, that you got talent and shit in here. Tell him that you need to to fulfill yourself as an artist and not just do the, you know, the, the party shit. Yeah, the party <laughs> shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and then I started to see him get on more digital records and I was like, okay, Pac is starting to. You know, move up mm -hmm. from just being, you know, in the background mm -hmm. to actually, you know what I mean, doing some songs. So he had that in him where he wanted to release it and sure. to just see him grow as an artist to become, you know, damn near like uh, the Marvin Gaye of hip hop. Like, you know, so true. Um, it, it was it's just an incredible journey to see. His solo records became a lot more serious and thought provoking. Cube was a huge inspiration for Tupac, who had a lot of love and admiration for him. No wonder why Park's music early on in his career had a heavy focus on politics, social issues facing American society like racism, police brutality, poverty, black on black crime, teenage pregnancy, etc. The topics were somewhat similar to what NWA addressed in their music, even though their styles were completely different. Straight Outta Compton was one of Park's favorite albums, and so was America's Most Wanted which introduced the world to the female rapper Yo-Yo, who appeared as a guest on the track It's a Man's World. Ice Cube took her under his wing and produced her upcoming album Make Way for the Motherload, which dropped the following year. Tupac met her with Cube when he was performing with Digital Underground. Pac and Yo-Yo got very close and even had a relationship in the early 90s. They went on tours together, sometimes with Cube, sometimes without, and Park was also invited to a birthday party, shortly after the movie Boys in the Hood came out, in which Cube plays the character Darren Baker, aka Doughboy. This was Ice Cube's first movie appearance. At Yo-Yo's birthday party they took pictures together, and she even introduced Park to her mother. 
Cube then dropped his sophomore album Death Certificate in 1991. And that same year, Pac released his debut album Tupacalypse Now and starred in the movie Juice, which came out on January 17th, 1992. So they both tried to get their rapping and acting careers going, while Cube was higher in status and more respected in both fields at that point in time. The movie director John Singleton then wanted Ice Cube in his movie Poetic Justice with the pop icon Janet Jackson. Cube pressured him to give him the script to find out what the movie was about and didn't like what he was reading. So he asked him to change it but he refused. John Singleton then decided to replace Cube with Tupac, cause they needed a rapper who was also acting. There weren't too many options back then. Cube was the most successful actor at the time, but the director was impressed by Tupac's acting skills. The movie was filmed between April 14th and July 4th of 1992 and came out on July 23rd, 1993. It became a cult classic and was a good look on Tupac's resume for his acting career. According to Cube, him stepping down from doing the movie helped Tupac to become a movie star. And the reason why he gave up on that movie was because the director refused to change one particular part in the script. The problem was me playing Tupac. I don't think I'd kick my homeboy out the car for a girl I just met when we got to Oakland. I didn't think that was cool. It kinda made the character a sucker to me. The scene Cube appears to be referring to is the one that saw Tupac's character Lucky which is a mail carrier and aspiring rapper, attack his friend, for hitting Janet Jackson's character Justice, who kicked Puck's friend in the groin because he had hit his girl in the face. Puck then beats up his homie and kicks him out the vehicle. Cube hated that character just for that scene alone, said that the role suits Puck more than him, which could be interpreted as a jab, since Cube called that character a sucker. Why would you say that the role of a sucker suits Tupac? Park later called himself Sucker for Love on the song Do For Love, which was recorded in 1994 but came out posthumously. It actually landed on the album Are You Still Down, Remember Me, which dropped on November 25th, 1997. So Park didn't really care about people like Cube making fun of him for being a quote-unquote sucker for love. The question is, why did Cube say that? Because of Puck's superior adaptation skills? Or maybe something similar to that scene happened where Puck ditched Cube for a girl when they were hanging out. Cause why else would you get that impression from him? Maybe it was about Yoyo, or a different girl. Cause Puck started to become very popular with women. So it wouldn't surprise me if something like that had happened in real life. And if you look at the reasons why Cube didn't want to play that role, and also take a look at all the movies he did afterwards, you start to notice that he had no problem playing in kids, comedy and love movies. Cube has played a lot of roles in his acting career that made him look soft or like a sucker so to speak. But maybe he was just a little stubborn in the early days and later learned how to adapt to different roles after getting used to acting. Cause it wouldn't make much sense for a guy like Cube who just started acting to reject a movie where he gets to play the lover of a superstar like Janet Jackson who had released multiple classic albums that sold over 10 million copies each and had another album on the way that went to sell over 14 million units. No one in their right mind would reject that kind of offer. It would have gotten him exactly where he wanted to be in his acting career. But again, maybe Cube felt a little uncomfortable playing roles that don't match his gangster image cause the rap world would have judged him based on the movie. The same way rap fans judge you based on your lyrical content, what you say in interviews and how you appear in music videos and live shows. He might have thought that it could have hurt his gangster image. Meaning that people start to believe that the stories he tells in his lyrics are fake. That he's not a gangster. That he lacks authenticity and is only acting. Kinda similar to Ice-T rapping after police and then later playing the police in TV shows and movies. And Ice Cube was the face of gangster rap in the late 80s and early 90s. And now all of a sudden here comes Park and gets away with everything. Cube saw how it benefited Park's rapping and acting career. 
so he saw it as a missed opportunity and started to regret his decision. John Singleton was also impressed by Park's acting skills and delivery of emotions. His acting in the movie Juice was perfect. Cube was not on Park's level when it came to showing vulnerability, emotion, sadness, empathy, affection and love. A love movie with a guy like Cube who feels uncomfortable to show emotions wouldn't work. He had a hard time catching up to Park when it came to display of emotions in movies and also in music. It was tempting to work with Janet Jackson, but I wanted to love the movies I was in. <laughs> you know, I was, I was like, this part is going to come about and I'm going I'm to just hate, hate Damn. this part. I didn't do Poetic Justice, mm -hmm. so John went and got Tupac to do it. I'm glad Tupac did it. I think he killed it. It was just cool to see another rapper in the game getting a shot on the big screen. While filming the movie Poetic Justice from April 14th to July 23rd, 1992, Park and Cube hung out together on numerous occasions. Tupac also recorded his sophomore album, which includes the song Last Words, featuring Ice Cube and Ice T. There's footage of them together in the studio, hanging out and freestyling. Cube and Ice-T were sitting and relaxing while Puck was standing there like a fan almost. Cause he was super humble and saw Cube and Ice-T almost like older brothers. Cause those two were actually the ones that took West Coast hip hop and gangster rap in general to the next level. The song they did together is extremely underrated and overlooked. They all did a great job lyrically and Puck was just getting better and better with every album. His friendship with Yo-Yo also turned into a love affair and relationship around that time. They were really close and there were rumors that Cube had a problem with that. The two appeared together in the music video for Petra's song Romantic Call in 1993. Their love relationship didn't last long as Park turned more and more into a player. He started dating all of Yo-Yo's female friends. He was very popular with women in general. Back then, he even put out a song called I Get Around, in which he's bragging about his sexual conquests. So the relationship with Yo-Yo didn't last and they both decided to go their separate ways. From March 93 to May 94, Puck recorded the group album Thug Life. And then he started to record his next solo project, which was his breakthrough album Me Against the World. On July 14th, 1994, he recorded the song Dear Mama, which is widely regarded as one of his best songs. The original version contained a sample from Ice Cube's song It's a Man's World off his debut album America's Most Wanted, on which he was rapping back and forth with the rapper Yo-Yo. They trade bars and debate the place of women in hip-hop and in the hood. It's an even-handed debate and was definitely a groundbreaking move in the gangster rap scene, although it didn't necessarily show Cube from his compassionate, caring and tolerant side. He was still playing his gangster role and looked down on women. Kinda like how he wanted the movie Poetic Justice to be. Ice Cube's song wasn't entirely misogynistic. He actually had Yo-Yo on there to go back and forth and to counter all his arguments. He was indirectly uplifting women as well, by giving her a platform and by making Yo-Yo stand up for all the women and defend them against a gangster like Ice Cube. Tupac used the sample to dedicate an entire song to his mother, while showing love and respect to women in general. This is a man's world, thank you very but much. It wouldn't be a damn thing without a woman. It wouldn't be a damn thing. I just wrote it down and it came out like like tears, you know? And right after I wrote it, I called my mom and I rapped it to her over the phone like live. She was like crying. I was like, that's a hit. Park used Yo Yo, who was supposed to be the voice for the women on Ice Cube's track as a repeated sample next to his own heartfelt and uplifting lyrics, putting as much feeling and emotion into the song as possible, words that come straight from the heart and paint vivid pictures, thematizing his own insecurities, fears and emotions, even though people labeled him as a cold-blooded thug and gangster, which in most cases is closely related to toxic masculinity, something that people often criticize Cube for saying that he is incapable of expressing love and emotion as he's stuck in his cold, one-dimensional tough guy role. Cube didn't want to be like Tupac and be a sucker for women. Park, on the other hand, tried to make it okay for tough, macho men to show themselves from their sensitive side and be a little mama's boy, so to speak, while simultaneously being a real man. And Cube didn't really like that, which again was the reason why he couldn't play the role in Poetic Justice. 
A lot of people have accused Ice Cube of being jealous of Tupac because of it. He not only outshined him acting wise, but he was also becoming a threat on a rapping level. Ice Cube was becoming obsolete and the new guys were taking over. Which Pac believes was one of the reasons why Cube didn't allow him to use that sample. Yo-Yo didn't appear on the final version of Dear Mama due to Cube having a problem with it. Cause a day after putting the song together, Tupac came back to the studio to listen to it on a cassette tape. And he told DJ King Assassin, the guy who did the scratches on the song, that they can't clear the sample for the yo-yo parts because Cube told the manager of his label Lenchmark Records that Pac can't use it. Tupac was devastated when he heard the news because at the time he thought that would be his breakthrough single. And now, right before putting it out and getting his career to the next level, Cube comes and pulls the brakes, sabotaging the song in the process. At least that's how Pac felt. He thought Cube ruined the classic and doesn't want to see Pac succeed. And at the time, Pac was really running out of money due to all the lawyer fees for the Ayana Jackson assault case. He was desperately trying to create the next hit and wrap himself out of financial ruin. He was super mad at Cube for doing that. Pac was under the impression that the song Dear Mama wouldn't work without that one yo-yo line, which in the original version was used twice in the intro and 10 times in total in the hooks. So they were forced to remake the song as the intro, outro and the hook were basically ruined. According to DJ King Assassin, it was Cube's jealousy and ego that made him stop Pac from using that sample. Ice Cube had yo-yo on his label and was basically responsible for her success. So she had to stay loyal to Cube and couldn't just meet up with Tupac and work something out. And even if she could, Yo-Yo was never informed by Cube that Tupac wanted to sample her vocals. So when DJ King Assassin informed her about it, she started crying. Cause her and Pac had broken up prior to that song and lost contact even though the relationship didn't end in a bad way. According to Yo-Yo herself, he wanted to include her vocals to do something sweet for her. She would have been on one of the greatest and most emotional hip-hop records of all time. On a song that's empowering women, with Yo-Yo being the quote-unquote brand new intelligent black lady, being something like a feminist almost. Yo-Yo has never stopped loving Tupac even after his death. She even came to the hospital right before he died. So yeah, they were really close. And according to DJ King Assassin, Tupac was enraged and super mad about it. He felt like he got stabbed in the back by a friend. Him and the DJ couldn't understand how Cube could sample everybody's songs on his albums, but didn't allow his friends to use one little line from an old song. Ice Cube heard that both the DJ and Pac were mad at him for that, and Cube then stopped talking to them. And afterwards, he also stopped producing for Yo-Yo. He was the executive producer for her first three albums, Make Way for the Motherload in 1991, Black Pearl in 1992, and You Better Ask Somebody in 1993. The two ex-NWA members Dr. Dre and Cube then came together to do a reunion album called Helter Skelter, which was supposed to come out in January 95 on Death Row Records, to which Tupac would sign to in Autumn 95. But they ended up scrapping the album and Cube never collaborated with Death Row again. They had already recorded their first single called Natural Born Killers, which ended up on the Murder Was The Case soundtrack. On October 20th, Tupac was invited to come to the set for the shoot of the music video and make a cameo appearance as the sniper who kills Ice Cube in the final scene. But there are no pictures or videos of them together. Only pictures you see of Tupac outside in the dark with the video director Gary Gray. The scenes of Dre and Cube were shot in a different session inside a building. So they weren't hanging out together. They all just recorded their scenes and left. Pac was only in one little scene. A sniper that's all alone and pretending to aim at the cameraman. They later edited the scenes to make it look like he's shooting Ice Cube. But the two scenes were recorded in different sessions. Cube wasn't there anymore when they filmed Tupac's final scene. Suge Knight, the label boss of Death Row Records, had previously paid Tupac for the songs Poor Little Liquor, Pain and Loyal to the Game, 
which were all on the movie soundtrack to Above the Rim, the movie Park played in after Poetic Justice. The soundtrack came out on March 22, 1994 under the label Death Row Records. And the music video for Dr. Dre and Cube's Natural Born Killers came out on November 27, 1994, just three days before the Quad Studio shooting in New York, in which Park got shot five times. I made a video on this which you should definitely check out. So Park gets shot, goes to prison on abuse charges on February 7th, 1995, gets bailed out by Shug Knight on October 12th that same year and gets signed to Death Row Records. When Tupac joined that label and when the whole East Coast West Coast war was going on in hip hop, Park was paying close attention to everything that was said during the coastal beef. He saw everyone that was sending shots at the West Coast as his enemy. And every West Coast artist dissing the East Coast, he saw as a potential teammate and ally. He took the East Coast West Coast war very seriously, as he had become the face of it. The media had declared him and the notorious P.I.G. as the protagonists of that beef. He didn't tolerate any disrespect towards the people on his coast. Everyone dissing Snoop, the Dog Pound, Dre, Death Row, his friends or West Coast artists in general, he saw as an enemy and was ready to diss them. Ice Cube at the time had formed his own little group and was collaborating with the West Coast MCs Mac-10 and Dub C, with whom he had dropped the single West Side Slaughterhouse in 1995, on which they were responding to a rapper from Chicago called Common Sense, who in 1994 released his sophomore album Resurrection, with the lead single I Used to Love Her, which tells the story of a girl he fell in love with which Carmen used as a metaphor for hip-hop. So he's metaphorically describing the evolution of hip-hop and how the genre changed over time once the West Coast took over. Carmen is not fond of the way hip-hop has developed once the West Coast started influencing the genre as a whole. So Carmen ends the song by saying that he will try to take hip-hop back to its roots and that he wants to make it stop to be so gangsterish, violent and obscene. So of course rappers on the west coast took offense to that, including Ice Cube and Tupac. Pac was just itching to respond but the song I Used To Love Her was released in 1994, before Tupac started rapping the west coast the way he did after signing to death row and after being released from prison. So the timing wasn't right. If it was he would have definitely this common for that song alone, even if he didn't mean it that way, like he later clarified. Somebody had to step up and defend the West Coast. That's how people felt back then. The person in charge for the West Coast, who was both lyrically top tier and also respected in the rap game, was Cube at the time. Puck saw how Cube, Mac-10 and Dub C were dissing Common in 1995, while he was in prison. On the song West Side Slaughterhouse, which was on Mac-10's self-titled album, released on June 20th. On October 12th, Park came out of prison and a lot of people on the west coast started reaching out to him. Basically every major artist in LA, except people like Ice Cube, Mac-10 and Dub C. Park always looked up to him, was inspired by him. So he was like, if I was cool with Cube right now, I would be going at Carmen for him. But now I'm staying out of it. Cause Park and Cube weren't close anymore. Cube didn't write to him or reach out to him while he was in prison. He also started his own movement with Westside Connection, instead of becoming part of the Death Row family. He also cancelled the collab album with Dre, so they grew apart. Park used to call him, but he never got on the phone or called back. There was tension between the two, and Park was trying to figure out what was wrong. It was later revealed by Gonzo, member of the group Caution, which was signed to Cube's label Lenchmark Records who would also become an honorable member of Tupac's group Outlaws, that Cube quote-unquote crossed him, the same way he did Gonzo even though he was signed to his label. Cube used to do that to people he didn't want to work with or talk to, so he ignored him basically and didn't want to have anything to do with Pac anymore. And Gonzo of course informed Tupac about that. Shug Knight thought of signing Ice Cube to the label and of more or less reviving the group NWA, but without Easy e who had passed away on March 26 that year. Dre and Cube were actually dissing Easy e on the scrapped album Helter Skelter, but Cube and E squashed their beef in time and the disses never came out. 
there were actually plans for an NWA reunion, with Cube and Dre coming together as the OGs of the group, and Snoop and the Dog Pound serving as a replacement for MC Ren, Yella and Eazy E. Cause the beef with Eazy E's label Ruthless Records was still on. Shug wanted to profit off of that whole movement. Cause NWA is what made gangster rap so popular. The whole label Death Row was built on the success of that group. But those plans failed because Cube didn't want to sign to Death Row Records. He had his own label called Lenchmob Records and both Cube and Dre had big egos at the time. Nobody wanted to give up on their own label and movement to sign to their ex-NWA partner. Cause Cube had originally left the group NWA to start his own label, instead of signing to Easy East label Ruthless Records. And giving up on Lenchmob Records to sign under Dre's label wasn't a good look for him. Even though Death Row was way bigger and way more successful. Everybody wanted to be the number one. Not just number one on their label, but also number one on their coast and in hip-hop in general. Cube coming over to Death Row wouldn't benefit him, as he wouldn't be a priority within the label. Cause all the other artists were bigger than him. And your music would suffer based on your hierarchy within the label. The most popular artist on the label gets the best beats. Everyone else has to wait for their turn. And be happy with what they get. Cube chose to be the number one artist on Lenchmob Records, a less successful label, over being the number four on the more successful Death Row Records, meaning behind Dre, Snoop and Pac. When Tupac came over to Death Row, all eyes were on him, which funny enough became the title of his upcoming album. He became so popular that even Dre, the OG, got outshined. He wasn't the number one artist on the label anymore. And Shook didn't want them to work on Dre's new album until they're done using Park's hype at the time to their advantage, which made Dre almost feel like an intern over there. That, along with a bunch of other reasons I will touch on in a future video, made him leave his own label, cause he was the co-owner of Death Row Records. The same thing but worse would have happened to Cube. Park was just taking over. Ice Cube saw that and was, I don't want to say intimidated and jealous, but it did kinda shock him. To see a guy who was once a fan of him, and had been inspired by him for all these years, to outgrow him and to quote unquote master his style, as Pac would later describe it. Even if they came out dissing me, I could destroy them. I've mastered their styles. They could keep writing new shit, but I've mastered their styles, like the Five Deadly Venoms. Right, right. They had the Five Deadly Venoms, right? And the teacher made one more nigga that knew all their styles. So all he had to do was get next to a nigga like that, and he could destroy it. A fan of him had become his biggest competition on the West Coast. Cause think about it, Dre was the biggest rapper on the West Coast at the time. But the game never ranked him above Cube as he was the one writing lyrics for him. And he also destroyed him in their little lyrical exchange of words. Which essentially led to NWA's dissolution in 1991. So Dre got humbled by Cube. And Snoop was seen as his little sidekick who was lucky to get someone like him to produce his debut album, but he was still super popular. Easy e had passed away, so who else was really the representative for the west coast at the time? Cube felt like it was him. He was selling a lot of units, was lyrical and was also doing movies. And now all of a sudden Park is trying to take away his spot, by not only surpassing Dre and making everyone else on the label sit on the reserve bench so to speak but also by coming for the number one spot worldwide. Cause once his double album All Lies On Me came out, he was outselling and outshining everybody. So Cube definitely felt some type of way about it. And people to this day still criticize him for refusing to give Tupac his flowers. To him, Pac was always just a little boy, who only got so far because of OGs like him. He knows that Pac was inspired by him, Cube is a very competitive MC. He would never admit that Tupac was better or on the same level as him. Cause Park doesn't even appear in his top 20. It would have been impossible to do an NWA reunion with Tupac and Cube in the same group. They tried bringing back the old NWA crew after Tupac had passed. They wanted Snoop to replace Easy e and brought back MC Ren. Only songs they were able to put out were Hello and Chinchak recorded between 1998 and 1999. All the other songs they recorded never saw the light of day. 
So they once again were forced to cancel their plans of reviving NWA. The members of the group had little chemistry and were too competitive for it to work. Everyone wanted to do their own thing and be the number one in their own lane. Dre had his label Aftermath and had signed Eminem. Snoop became a No Limit soldier and wanted his own label. MC Ren was past his prime and Cube wanted to do movies. So everyone just went their separate ways and they were overall just too big to do another NWA album. Everyone wanted to shine on their own without getting too close with each other. That had been the case since the NWA breakup. Their friendship suffered because of their competitiveness and their egos. And that was also the problem between Cube and Puck. You turn to me today, I go, can you write to this? Right. Can I, security? Can I write to this? Is you crazy? I had to stop and go, Dre, you do not know how long I waited to get in this booth and I have Dre out there going, you ready? Are you you ready? know what I mean? Yeah. I waited all my life for that, so it's straight out of Compton. Puck was a huge NWA fan. He had always looked up to them. That's why he was excited to work with Dre. But once he got to know him, outgrew him, and once Dre left the label, it was kinda like when Cube left NWA. He was seen as a traitor. Puck had worked with Cube in the past too. And then he sabotaged his song Dear Mama. So the respect he had for people who inspired him, like Dre and Cube for example, slowly started to fade away. He had become too big of an artist to look up to people he felt were below him. Especially when they did him dirty. Cause that's how Park felt about Cube. He had a song on the album All Eyes On Me called Two of America's Most Wanted, which originally was supposed to be a Snoop Dogg song, the lead single to his upcoming album The Dog Father. But again, all eyes were on Park, so he absorbed everything Death Row had to offer at that time and used it to get himself on top. The song was supposed to be Snoop Dogg solo and called America's Most Wanted, the same as Ice Cube's classic debut album from 1990. The project was named after the debut single of that album. In Cube's song America's Most Wanted, he's rapping about a criminal life that catches up with a wanted man. Park and Snoop did the same thing on their song. They rapped about a criminal life, them getting acquitted of murder and assault charges and fighting in court for their freedom. Cube felt like Park and Snoop were copying him, but they were at the same time way more successful. So this was the second time now that Cube felt like Puck was biting him. First with the song Dear Mama and now with two of America's most wanted. Puck didn't see it as biting. One song was a dedication to his mother and the other was a collab with Snoop. Puck thought that it was the other way around, that Cube was actually stealing ideas from him. Accused him of stealing his soul swagger. The bandana, even though it seems like Cube had it first, the W hand sign, the frequent use of the phrase West Side, his war mentality, his mafioso style, and he also thought that the group West Side Connection is a ripoff of Thug Life. It's not clear if Cube stole the West Side hand sign from Park. Cause on his song Enemy off the album Lethal Injection in 1993, he said that he's throwing up the W. Now I change my style up, my style up, bodies pile up, just a trouble, you throwing up the W. Cube fans always used this line to defend him. They also sampled that line on August 95 on the song West Up from the group Dub C and the Mad Circle, which also features Mac 10 and Ice Cube. West C F L E N yeah. This was before Park came out of prison in October 95. Cube wasn't really known for that until Park started doing it frequently on his shows, covers, pictures, in interviews and also in music videos. The first time Park saw Cube throw up the W was on the cover of the May 96 issue of the Source magazine and then later in the Bow Down music video. This was months after Park dropped his All Eyes On Me album with that iconic cover of him forming a W with his right hand and using his other hand to show off his death row necklace. And that's why Park thought he was biting him. Cube didn't really pose like that prior to the All Eyes On Me album. Park was also making fun of Cube for not forming the W correctly, like he does. He thought Cube was trying to imitate him. The W that everyone uses nowadays is closer to the one Park used, hiding the thumb behind the hand so that there are only four fingers visible. Cube on the other hand never did it like Park did, always held his thumb close to the index finger. 
and didn't hide it behind the hands to make it look more like a W. Both wanted to set a trend with their W signs, so that there's only one way to do it, the right way. Most people use the sign Tupac used, and he's the first person that comes to mind when thinking about the West Coast sign. Cube throwing up the W right after Tupac made it popular, made it almost seem like he's trying to use the wave Tupac started for himself, after sabotaging Tupac's song Dear Mama and not reaching out to him. As for the phrase West Side, Cube used it years before Pac even came to death row. On the song You Know How We Do It, for example, which came out in 1993. People also accused Cube of biting Pac's war mentality. But the West Side Connection was already doing pro-West slash anti-everybody type of songs before Tupac came out of prison. Like for example on the songs For Life and West Side Slaughterhouse on Mac 10's album, which came out in June 1995, or on the song West Up, which was on the Dub C and the Mad Circle album, released in August 1995. This whole you better respect the West or else type of rapping. The West Side Connection was already doing that. Treating the West Coast like a gang almost while making bold statements like hip-hop started in the West or that they rule hip-hop. Mac 10, you know you rule hip-hop, Ben. Yes, Scott LaRock, you know you rule hip-hop, ay. Yes, D-Nice, you know you rule hip-hop, ay. Mac 10, you know you rule hip-hop, Ben. Wait a minute, that ain't how the West Coast rock. Look at hip-hop started in the West. Ice Cube bailing through the East without a vest. You know in the East? We could be brothers, but when you come to L.A., watch them loud-ass colors, what's up, the East-West conflict existed since around 1991, so it wasn't something that Tupac and his label started, but they certainly were the most direct and aggressive ones. They had the biggest impact and were the most important figures of the conflict. Cube's jabs at the East Coast on West Side Slaughterhouse in 1995 didn't really leave a mark compared to Tupac's hit him up. Tupac didn't even acknowledge Cube's diss record as fuel for the East-West war, he didn't think of them as generals of the war, so to speak. He thought of them as trend followers, not as leaders. People that try to use his way for success. Cause before Hit Him Up, none of the anti-East Coast disc records were bringing people on the West together. Cause radio hosts and rappers on the East would always make fun of the West. Intercoastal conflicts were always treated as disagreements and beefs between individuals. It wasn't marketed and promoted as a coastal beef one coast versus the other, until Pac and Big got involved. Cube's movement wasn't big enough to accomplish that. So when Cube dropped the song Bow Down in August 96, Pac thought he was trying to ride his wave. West Side Connection wasn't as radical as Tupac and the Outlaws. They didn't really go directly at the East. What Cube made clear, however, is that nobody can disrespect the West without consequences like against Common Sense and A Tribe Called Quest, for example. Park's beef was way more personal. Cube never crossed the line. They always played fair. They didn't really have underlying hatred for the East like Park and Death Row did. Cause the people on the row saw them as their mortal enemies, like I explained in my recent video, the reason why Diddy killed Tupac. People lost their lives and that's why Death Row went to that extreme. Park was ready for smoke and ready to battle anybody. If you actually do your research, you'll find out that Park was screaming F New York on records like NY87, for example. Cube and the West Side Connection were only defending their coast. It was all friendly competition to them. But Park, seeing them make the slightest move against the East Coast, made him think that they're trying to ride his wave. Between 1994 and 1995, Cube believed that his style was starting to become outdated. He began making adjustments in an attempt to regain his mainstream relevance in some shape or form. He didn't want to get left behind by the Snoops, Dre's, Parks and Bigs of the world. And a lot of people have accused him of stealing ideas from other MCs in hope that he can use them to catch up to everyone else. That's how the beef with the West Coast rap group Cypress Hill started. They accused him of stealing the hook of his song Friday from Cypress Hill's song Throw Your Set in the Air. He was facing biting accusations from all directions, not just from Tupac. 
Ice Cube was starting to get overshadowed and outsold by artists from all around the US. So Pac thought he was trying to profit off of the East Coast West Coast beef by becoming part of it. So that the magazines and the media put their names next to the protagonists of the conflict. Meaning next to Tupac and Biggie. After Tupac released a song Hit Him Up against like a dozen rappers on the East Coast, and after slowly evolving into a mafioso rap type of artist with his alias Machiavelli the Dawn, Pac was under the impression that Cube tried to copy that formula by calling himself the Dawn of the West Coast and by dissing other artists. About to drop the bomb, I'm the West Coast Dawn. Big fish in a small pond. Pac knew that Cube called himself the Dawn before he came out of prison and before he changed his name to Machiavelli the Dawn. Cube started doing that right around the time Pac got incarcerated in early 95. Ever since Cube got close with Dub C and Mac 10. This was the same song on which Westside Connection dissed Carmen. So Pac knew about the existence of it, since he wanted to battle Carmen. But the problem Pac had with Cube wasn't him calling himself the Dawn. But once you claim to be the dawn of a whole coast, you're indirectly implying that everyone else on that coast is lower than you in hierarchy. Meaning that Cube is the number one rapper on the west and that Tupac has to bow down even though he's the highest selling and most hyped rapper at that moment in time. Bow down. Cause I ain't a hater like you. Bow down to a killer that's greater than you. I, I bow down respectfully, not bow down to them as mean or right, performers, right. but as elders. Like that's like if you see any old mob coming, you know what I mean? Get yeah, that yeah, table yeah. before you give me a table. Right, right, let right, him right. in before you let me in, because I do know I'm the don there. But I know if I'm not the don, I want that respect because that to be the don at one point means you had to have something. They diss me. If they diss me, I would have dissed them. Tupac, of course, had a problem with that. He thought first he tried to sabotage his song, got in between him and Yo Yo. And now he tries to come at him like this, even though they're friends. While all his other friends are happy that he's finally out of prison and are reaching out to him to show love. Cube wasn't always like this. Rapping the West almost like a gang, ready for confrontation, participating in intercoastal wars, that only started with West Side Connection. Cause when Tim Dog dissed Tim and the West Coast on the song F Compton in 1991, he didn't even respond even though it was direct and not a subliminal diss like Carmen's song I Used to Love Her, for example. Park was wondering why he didn't make a song like Bow Down and rap his coast before the media blew up the whole East-West conflict due to the beef between the labels Death Row and Bad Boy. When people like Tim Dog dissed him and made fun of the West Coast, he was as quiet as a church mouse, even though he was lyrically able to respond, like he did against NWA with No Vaseline. And now all of a sudden he strikes back at everyone for only mentioning the west coast and for sharing their opinions without trying to diss them. After leaving his group in December 89, Cube actually collaborated with a lot of artists and producers on the east coast. His debut album America's Most Wanted was produced by the Bomb Squad, which is a New York production team known for their work with the rap group Public Enemy. And after all those years of profiting from the east coast, all of a sudden, without a reason that you can point to, like Park's shooting at the Quad Studios in New York for example, Cube starts dissing the same coast that helped him to get back on his feet after leaving NWA. At least that's how Park saw it. Cube wasn't directly dissing the East, he was just defending the West Coast. They were directly dissing a tribe called Quest on the song Cross Him Out and Put A K, which came out after Tupac died. And the song Bow Down was more of a anti-everyone type of song. Unlike Hit Him Up, which was mainly anti-East Coast. Bow Down was more of a catchy West Coast anthem. And not really a diss song. It was just weird for Park to see Cube on the cover of the Source magazine putting up the W. And then to hear Bow Down, a pro-West anti-everyone type of song, with his homies supporting him just like the Outlaws supported Park. That same summer Hit Him Up came out. Cube was battling Cypress Hill, Common, a tribe called Quest, everyone who tried to diss the west coast. So just like Park, Cube was in war mode. It felt like he was planning to battle everybody. And that's what got Park confused. Since he was the one that was portrayed as the guy who stepped up to battle everyone. 
take on a whole coast on his own. You could get the impression that one is trying to mimic the other. Not only that, but Park was also convinced that the song Bow Down was a rehash or at least inspired by his song Hit Him Up. But Mac 10 from Westside Connection denied it, saying that they were quote unquote too into what they were doing and didn't even care about what Hit Him Up or any other record sounded like. Bow Down came out in August 96, Hit Him Up on June 4th. So on the surface it looks like Westside Connection copied them. But Bow Down was recorded in 1995. You could make the argument that it was still possible for them to copy Hit Him Up since the original version was recorded on October 31st, 1995. Assuming that Q heard the original version and then recorded Bow Down. But they had no contact and weren't in the studio together. And they were defending the west coast before Park came out of prison. So Cube did not bite hit him up like Park claims. All you suckers wanna diss the Pacific, but you busted never get specific. But if you living on the west side of your town, make them other fools bow down. Park thought Cube was trying to take some of his shine during the whole East-West beef, as he was viewed as the face of the West Coast at the time. And now all of a sudden we have Cube calling himself the West Coast Down who's quote unquote running everything west to Mississippi. Tupac had just recorded his Machiavelli The Dawn Illuminati album. The Dawn was written on the album cover. So he thought people might start accusing him of biting Cube and the whole Dawn thing. Cause Cube had used it before him, but not as frequently. Just like the whole thing about the West Side sign and also the bandana, Tupac wanted the Dawn title for himself. Just like the word Thurk, Outlaw, M.O.B. and all the other words that people connect with Tupac. He wanted everybody to think about him when using the word Dawn. Or when using the word Thurk, Thurk Life. He actually started beefing with people for using his terms. Like for example when Nas used the word Thurk. Park called him out on that on the original version of the song When Thurks Cry. Not only that, but he also called him out for rapping about getting shot. And we're rapping about my motherfucking life. I'm talking uh, fake, man. Motherfucker. Fuck you talking about he got shot and left the house. Motherfucker. Yeah, motherfucker. Yeah, when? Yeah, what yeah, month, motherfucker? What motherfucker? What month, Jelly? I'm talking about cat and shooting. The reason why I'm mentioning this is because Tupac was a little sensitive when it came to people rapping about topics that he himself addressed in his lyrics. Biting was frowned upon back in the day. Just using the same words was enough reason for Tupac to go at you. Especially when that word or phrase describes Tupac or his life. Like Thurk, Dawn, Westside, MOB, Outlaws, Thurk Life, shot five times, left the hospital the same day. Park was paying close attention to that. He was also mad at Bone Thugs and Harmony for example. Cause they had the word Thurk in their name. But they actually showed love to Park and that's why they were cool. They made a song together called Thug Love, but Cube wasn't showing Park love, and that's why he got mad for calling himself the West Coast Dawn. Even if you had used the word before him, you had to show love. Park had a huge ego. That's why he thought Bow Down was aimed at him. Cube did indeed want Park to humble himself. Not only that, but there's also a scene in the beginning of the music video where you can see a guy who looks just like Tupac in the early days before he started wearing the bandana. Meaning before 1993. Cause Cube felt like Park was inferior to him and got a style and the look with the bandana from him. Cause Cube started wearing bandanas in autumn 92, around the time he released his album The Predator. You can see him wear it on the album cover and also in the music videos for the songs Wicked, It Was A Good Day and Check Yourself. And the earliest pictures of Tupac wearing a bandana were made in May 93. And the first music video where he wore it was on Papa's song, which came out in 1994. But Tupac made that look with a bandana iconic. When seeing a bandana, the first person that comes to mind is Tupac. And his most iconic pictures are with bandanas. Cube didn't wear them as frequently as Park. Most hip hop fans actually think that Park started wearing those before him. The person depicted in the music video of Bow Down is definitely supposed to be Tupac from the Poetic Justice era. 
before he signed to Death Row and represented the West Coast. This was further proof for Tupac that he was taking shots at him. Cause in the video he's bowing down while kissing Cube's ring to give him respect and reverence. While accepting that he's below him in hierarchy. That Cube is on top, the king and the boss, the dawn of the West Coast. While Pac is just one of the people in the audience who admires and looks up to him. Someone who doesn't stand out from the masses in contrast to Cube. And Park during that time was claiming the crown and the position for the number one spot, not just on the west coast but worldwide, for himself. On Hit Him Up, Park wasn't just dissing the east coast, but he was also making it seem like he is in charge of the west coast, indirectly telling people on the west to holler at him, to bow down, show respect and love. And now Cube is coming out with a song called Bow Down, with a video that seems to be a direct response to Hit Him Up showing Park that he is the one that has to bow down and show respect. Cause Machiavelli the Dawn ain't the Dawn of the West Coast. The real Dawn is Ice Cube. It was really bad timing. Cause the whole time Park was waiting for Cube to reach out to him. He found it strange how he never showed him love or paid him a visit ever since he came out of prison. He was expecting him to call him and to holler at him, while Cube had no interest in doing so. He was actually expecting Park to step to him, as he is the OG, the guy Park used to admire this whole time. Why am I supposed to reach out to that little guy? He's a fan of me. And that's why in the video, the actor that's supposed to depict Tupac ain't dressed like he was dressing while he was on death row. The fake Park was dressed like back in the day when he was still a little humble dude looking up to Cube, who was just trying to get his rapping and acting career going. That's how Cube remembered him, as a young cat who would ask Cube for favors. Like when they did the song Last Words together for Tupac's sophomore album. Back then he was super respectful and humble, but Cube felt like Park had become arrogant and ungrateful the whole reason why he stopped talking to him. After finding out that Park is mad about not being allowed to use a sample for Dear Mama. Their egos and pride made it impossible for them to work things out. That's why you never saw a Tupac and Ice Cube collaboration ever again. Cube became too competitive to work together with people that are on his level or even bigger than him in terms of success and status in the game. The people you saw Cube collaborating with at that point in time had a lower recognition value than him. He wanted to stand out. He preferred to create his own little group instead of working together with Death Row or Aftermath and reviving NWA. NWA could have once again revolutionized hip hop forever. It was a powerful movement, but he purposefully chose rappers that can work under him and don't expect a large share of the profits they make since Ice Cube is a superstar. Mac 10 and Dub C had a lower recognition value, so he could stick out on all his records and music videos while trying to become the face of West Coast Hip Hop. He also got the Bloods and the Crips behind him with Mac 10 and Dub C on his team. Another reason why Cube stayed away from Tupac and also from Death Row is because they signed Tupac. He thought they were trying to more or less replace him. Since the Helter Skelter album with Dre didn't work out, and Cube didn't end up getting signed to Death Row. They signed Tupac instead as a replacement and wanted to create their own little NWA 2.0, but without Cube. Replaced just like for the movie Poetic Justice. The two are actually quite similar in style due to Cube being such a big inspiration for him in the early days. And that's the reason why they ended up clashing. Two rapper turn actors that are super lyrical, that are throwing up the W, and are defending the west coast against rappers from all around the US. Cube thought Park was just trying to create drama out of nowhere to get everybody's attention. By dissing the whole industry and becoming the headline of all the magazines. He thought Park was just lying and creating false narratives to show the world that Cube is the one who's trying to start a beef. So that he has an excuse to diss him out of nowhere. Bullying the industry while he's the most hyped rapper in the world desperately trying to find a way to destroy his competition, even though there's enough room for everybody to coexist. And to summarize Park's thoughts, 
He was under the impression that Cube was trying to use the whole East-West conflict that the label Death Row reignited to his advantage, while for the first time ever claiming the title King of the West Coast for himself, indirectly implying that he's better than Puck. He felt like Cube was trying to use his formula and steal his shine and hype, after seeing that Puck's approach of making music resulted in higher record sales thought that Cube wanted a piece of the pie without actually showing love and giving props to the people who baked it, so to speak. The ones that were actually the protagonists of the coastal war, meaning Park, Shook, Snoop, Dre and the people from Death Row in general. He actually thought that Cube made his own version of Hit Him Up, was afraid that other artists on the west would do the same and create their own versions of Hit Him Up. Park wanted to prevent people from riding his wave and stealing his shine. This is my lane, nobody riding this wave except me and my team. That was Park's whole point. I dig Ice Cube, I looked up to him. But because I looked up to him and I studied his style, math and shit, I know what he's doing is wrong. He's a shit shame seller, so now he's going to the war shit, and he's using us as the gas. He just drops this shit called Bad Ass. And if you listen to it, you can see he heard hit him up and was like, oh, that's how it's supposed to be. Uh, Why he wasn't ba making a Bad Ass when I was in jail? That's what I mean, that's wrong. So now that's wrong. And I'm not gonna let that happen, because then that would make me obsolete. If I let him come back and take, you can't have this. You know what I mean? I'm not doing that. The interview took place on August 24th, 1996, just two weeks before he got shot in Las Vegas. He didn't have the chance to speak to Cube again, who on the other hand didn't find out about Park's comments until years later. Park recorded less than a dozen songs after doing this interview. And even though disc records were recorded in those last two weeks, none of them addressed Cube or contained subliminal disses against him. He might have wanted to sit back and watch him make his next move, to see if they were really trying to come at him, jack his style, steal his shine, and to find out if Cube really had some type of problem with him. After meeting Nas at the 96 MTV Music Awards on September 4th, Park told Shook that he wanted to take out some of the disses aimed at Nas and replace them with lines against somebody else who deserved them. Unfortunately, Park never had a chance to edit the album. As he got shot in Vegas just three days later, I broke this down in one of my videos, make sure to check it out. It was rumored that he wanted to unleash multiple diss tracks aimed at Cube. He was going to shift all his attention away from Biggie and put it towards Cube, until enough damage is done to move on to a different artist. He wanted to crush Cube's plans and his whole West Side connection, to make sure that everybody on the West and on the East knows who's in charge. He had already damaged Biggie, the number one rapper on the East, and that's why he wasn't the main focus on the Machiavelli album. Now it was time for Cube, the quote unquote West Coast Dawn. He was waiting for his next move. The West Side Connection album Bow Down was just about to drop. Actually came out on October 22nd, a month after Tupac's death. He wanted to see what they had to say and counter it with not only better music, but also with harder disses. Unfortunately, the shooting in Vegas ruined those plans and we never got to see how their beef would have turned out. Before he passed, Park went and told his crew the outlaws about his issues with Cube and explained them that they were coming for him on the song Bow Down. So the outlaws were prepared to continue their war against Cube and the West Side Connection, held a grudge against him even after Park passed. On November 20th, just two months after Tupac's death, Cube came to Washington DC and did an interview on BET Teen Summit, in which he criticized Tupac when asked about the East Coast West Coast war. He said that no matter how rich or broke you are, you can't just do anything you want to do, cause sometimes it catches up to you. Cube thought that Puck went too far with his diss song hit him up, that he shouldn't have talked about Biggie's wife, he should have focused on Biggie instead. He also said that his death should be a lesson for all of us. Ice Cube and Mac 10 sent a strong message to the music industry and hip hop fans and said that it was time for a ceasefire in the east coast west coast hip hop wars even though they were participating in it on their album. Cube used Tupac as a cautionary tale of what could happen if beef was taken too far. He did this in numerous interviews. Cube was then accused of being a hypocrite 
and of stealing Tupac's ad-lib on the song Bomb First from the Don Caluminati 7 Day Theory album, which was released on November 5th that year. Ice Cube took that and used it on the song We Clubbin' in 1997. And from that point on, he used it on almost every single one of his albums. It became Cube's most iconic ad-lib ever, even though he got it from Tupac. Napoleon from the Outlaws continued the beef even after Pac passed. In 1999, he was invited by the producer One Eye to come to a song with Cube, to bury the hatchet, so to speak. One Eye ended up producing several tracks on the album War and Peace Volume 2, The Peace Disc. The one that Napoleon was supposed to rap on was the lead single You Can Do It, which became one of the hits on the album. The producer was cool with both, Cube and Napoleon, was creating beats for them. When working on Cube's new album, he offered Napoleon to come over and to get on one of the tracks. So he went to the studio and started drinking. Then he thought back and remembered how Tupac was bothered by the song Bow Down and how he called himself the West Coast Dawn, shortly after Pac called himself Machiavelli the Dawn on his album All Eyes On Me. Again, Cube was calling himself the Dawn ever since they formed West Side Connection, which was in 1995 before Tupac came out of prison and created his alias Machiavelli the Dawn. But calling yourself the Dawn of the West Coast instead of just the Dawn made it seem like he was putting himself above Pac. So Napoleon started to get upset, wanted to know why Cube and Park were beefing, and why Cube was trying to diss him. He was super loyal and didn't even think about the consequences, that him confronting Cube would negatively affect his career by losing the chance of being on a track with him. Cause Cube was one of Napoleon's favorite rappers growing up, and was selling more units than the outlaws could sell on their own, meaning without Park. Just like Tupac, he originally had a lot of love and admiration for him, but when they met, Napoleon approached him and asked him if he this Tupac. Your cube man, let me holler at you. On the song you said that you're the West Coast Dawn, man. Was you trying to talk about Pac? Man, it looked like you was dissing Pac, man. Was you dissing Pac? His tone was kinda harsh and serious. Cube was shocked. Thought they just invited him as a guest to come do a song with him. And now he's picking a fight out of nowhere. Napoleon was hot-headed, and it seemed like he was verbally attacking Cube, who then said, nah, I wasn't talking about Tupac, and then walked out the room. Napoleon waited for like a half an hour to 40 minutes, and Cube didn't come back, so he just left without finishing the song. The next day, the producer One Eye called him and was upset, asking Napoleon, what did you say to Cube, man? And Napoleon responded, Nah, I just asked him if he was dissing Puck. One Eye then said, Man, you messed up a chance of you being on a song with Ice Cube. But Napoleon's sense of loyalty prevented him to just forget about their past and do songs with people who were dissing Puck. As one of Puck's soldiers, he couldn't allow anyone to take shots at his general. And he didn't want to switch sides either. Just because the general is gone now doesn't mean that he can just join the enemy, meaning Cube cause they were still unsure if Cube was an enemy or not. It was all subliminal, so nobody was 100% sure. Napoleon lost his chance of getting on a song with him, and was instead replaced by West Side Connection member Mac-10. Not only that, but Cube also added a subliminal disc to one of the songs he recorded around that time called Let It Rain, which is a West Side Connection song that came out in 1999. Cube ends his verse by rapping Ain't no California love, just California slugs. Referencing Tupac's classic comeback single, California Love. Yeah, yeah. The West Side Connect thugs. Ain't no California love, no. just California slugs. A lot of people, including Napoleon from the Outlaws, took it as a shot at Tupac, after Napoleon had disrespected him in the studio. This was shortly after that incident, and there was more to it. The album War and Peace Volume 2 contains two more songs produced by One Eye. One is called Roll All Day and the other Wait Until Hates, 
which contains a sample of the lines Ain't No California Love, which he read on the song Let It Rain. The line was repeated in the intro and throughout the song. Why would he all of a sudden rap Ain't No California Love after meeting Napoleon? Was it really just coincidence? I mean, he did it twice in a row in the same year they met. It does seem like a little subliminal jab. And on just like all the other songs on the album, he called himself the Don. It also seemed like he's taking shots at Napoleon. In the outro, he tells us who this song is dedicated to. This is dedicated uh -huh. to them haters who ain't gonna kill nothing and who ain't gonna let nothing die. Napoleon didn't let the past be the past didn't want to put the beef to rest, and didn't let it die. The song was also produced by the same guy that made the beat for the song Napoleon was supposed to rap on. On the same album, there's also a song called You Ain't Got To Lie To Kick It. Park had a song titled Lie To Kick It, with the same phrase You Ain't Got To Lie To Kick It as the hook, which was on his posthumous album Are You Still Down, Remember Me from 1997. The song itself was originally recorded in 1993, back when Cube and Park were still close. On Cube's version, he once again calls himself the Dawn, and even mentions Tupac by name. People often criticize Cube for not showing love to Tupac in his interviews, and for more or less treating him like a little boy who didn't stand out as a rapper. Park never appeared in any of Cube's top lists. When you see him name his favorite rappers, like his recent top 15 for example, Park ain't even on the list. He named artists like Melly Mel, KRS One, Chuck D, Ice T, Snoop Dogg, Biggie, Jay Z, Nas, Raskas, Eminem, Lil Wayne, Black Thought, Slick Rick, Rakim, and he puts himself on that list as well. Park never appears in any of his lists even though the two had history, a rivalry and a friendship together. He loves to give props to his OGs, the people who inspired him, which is completely understandable. MCs like Melly Mel, Chuck D, Karis One, Rakim, Slick Rick and Ice-T are the ones who according to Cube inspired him and helped him to create his own style. But then he also named people who came out after him. So the argument that Cube only named rappers that came before him and purposefully left out MCs from the newer generation is invalid. He even added Raskas, Eminem and Wayne, and also Snoop Dogg, which is an interesting pick. What he also did is voice his opinion on lists where Tupac is ranked above him, in terms of best diss tracks for example. He thinks that his diss track No Vaseline is superior to Park Sit Him Up, as he didn't need the help and support from his homies to destroy his opponent which was the group NWA at the time, which consisted of Easy e Dr. Dre, MC Ren, and DJ Yella. How's Tupac number one when he needed help on that record? No Vaseline, one MC, took out four, Dola, four Dola. and the manager. Group was over. So Cube disagrees with people saying that Hit Him Up was the heart of this record, and he wants his props for single-handedly ending the group NWA. I can see why Cube would feel that way. He deserves credit for what he has accomplished with that record. Especially when we take into account that Hit Him Up was inspired by No Vaseline. Cause Park and the Outlaws learned from the OGs. Karis wants The Bridge Is Over, MC Lights 10% This, Cube's No Vaseline, Cool Mo D and LL Cool J's Back and Forth. He learned from all the legends. He actually showed love to them on the song Old School which is on the Me Against the World album released in 1995. I don't take Cube's comments as hating, even though a lot of Park fans are upset with some of the remarks he made over the years. Park never seems to get any praise from Cube. But deep down, I'm pretty sure that Cube had and still has a lot of love for Park, and they definitely would have squashed the beef if Park had survived the shooting in 1996. Pac was the man. He was cool. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. just one of those cool dudes. I know people know his persona. Sure, yeah. He was, you know, just one of those cool dudes. You know, I miss Pac. I miss him. 